to that. In fact, the more primitive uh, the, the life form, let's say an ant or uh, a uh, rodent of some kind, mice, rats, and we humans, the more primitive we are, the more mechanical we are. I mean, we breathe in, we breathe out, we have to eat at certain hours, we have to sleep every few hours every night. If we don't, our whole system breaks down, we, we, uh, we malfunction, we break down, etc. So I would be very careful about the word mechanical. We started out as highly mechanical, automated beings. We are moving toward entities or organisms that will uh, be much more difficult to predict and much more sophisticated where in fact we will have extraordinary uh, viability out in space, as I say, even in interstellar space. FM 2030 believed that technological progress would bring radical abundance and that automation would eliminate the necessity of paid employment. He also foresaw the coming of a wired world which would permit telecommuting and globalization of employment. In 1980, he wrote about teleconferencing, telemedicine, and teleshopping. He says satellite technology has already created the beginnings of what he calls a telesphere world, in which people won't just talk, they'll teleconnect. If one is teleconnected, one is, one is plugged in, then there is no far or near. And what this is doing is recontexting the architecture of life on this planet. Teleconnection, he says, will mean more and more of us working outside the plant or office. He concedes some jobs, the ones that require the worker to be there hands-on, will still exist, though in fewer numbers, as machines take over more and more of what passes for work in the 20th century. But the need to drive to work every day and spend several hours there and then drive back, etc., that will probably phase out. In fact, I'm sure it will phase out. Thanks again to telecommunication. FM believed technology would eliminate the Malthusian and environmental constraints on population growth, introduce new energy sources, and that humanity would soon spread to the rest of the solar system. FM 2030 says there's plenty of room left on Earth thanks to technology that makes it possible for humans to build cities in the deserts and outposts at the poles and to live almost anywhere we want. And then there's always space. In the coming years and decades, we will spread out across first near-Earth space, low-orbital, Earth-orbital, obviously lunar things, Martian colonies, so forth, and later deep space, meaning beyond Mars. So space is really not a problem. But somewhere later on, when we really move toward extensive colonization, where we begin colonizing, for example, Mars, and when we have a lunar base, and when we have you know, habitats elsewhere on the planet, and go out into what is called deep space, we obviously will have to make significant changes, in my view, in the human physiology, because these bodies are Earth-specific. They, they, they crystallized or coalesced out of specific conditions on this planet. But as we move out, where conditions are entirely different, mm -hmm. obviously we will need more sophisticated bodies. I mean, we're not going to, for example, be eating when we're out there in, let's say, uh, in the orbit of Neptune or in interstellar. FM spoke Arabic, French, Hebrew, and English. And like many futurists and cosmopolitans, he felt himself beyond national identity. He foresaw the world moving beyond the nation-state to a global, democratic, electronic democracy. He said, there are no illegal immigrants, only irrelevant borders. And uh, there are two things that we need. We have to accept the new and abandon some of the old. We have to accept new technology because it's the only way we're going to solve problems. Even if the technology doesn't succeed, nothing else will. We've got to gamble on the technology. And we've got to abandon some of the old. The nation state has to go away. We can no longer live with it. It's the route to destruction and suicide. But that's a very hard concept to sell, given the current political structure of this earth and given the kind of nationalism that we're seeing just this week in Iran, for example. No, Mr. Esfand, no. you don't think it's a hard concept to sell? Not at all, Tom. I think, in fact, if you uh, see the world flowing rather than freezing conditions on the planet, you see that there is or there has been an accelerating shift from nationalism which in the 1950s and the 40s was considered very revolutionary and idealistic and it was then as countries sought to overthrow hegemonies and imperialism and colonialism and so on 
where in the 1970s and 80s we're moving increasingly to something entirely new, and that is regionalism, common markets, regional blocks, uh, hemispherism, continentalism, and coincident with all this globalism. I don't think uh, nationalism is as pervasive as um, people presume. Not at all. Nationalism is everywhere on the retreat. If you'll forgive just a half a second of, of, of uh, saying I said so, 25 years ago <laughs> I was writing about the unit globalization of the market and the globalization of the economy. Are you uh, uh, optimism one, uh, tele telespheres and map wingers, and right. people dismiss it as you know, just too far? We are in the age, as you well know, of globalized you know, uh, economy, global job mobility, global telecommunication, global transportation, global uh, infrastructures, about 2,000 international and global organizations including of course the United Nations not to mention a lot of continental subcontinental hemispheric and global agencies and so forth communication is only one global transportation is yet another the the convergence of nations the fact that for example the EC meaning European community which again in the 1950s and 60s was not considered something that had a future people dismissed it as something you know an ideal or idealistic today has become a powerful powerful entity and by the same token, there are similar movements in Africa and Asia and South America and so on. And I see that as an irreversible trend toward globalization. But, you know, I hasten to add, Nancy, globalization is not our ultimate destiny. It's not our ultimate destination. What is our ultimate destination? Well, I'm not sure that there are any ultimate destinations. Mm -hmm. but FM thought the decline of the nuclear family was inevitable and that it should be replaced by new forms of villages raising children, new models of co-parenting and family. Is, is it your view mm -hmm. that marriage is... Uh, perhaps not such a good idea? Well, I would put it differently. I think the historical forces, Phil, which spawned and, uh, and, and sustained marriage associations and marriage systems, family systems through the ages, I think are just phasing out. Uh, all the things that family and marriage performed in the past now can be fulfilled outside of marriage. For instance, lovemaking, companionship, uh, procreation. But not parenthood. Well, shared parenthood. I think we're moving away from exclusive parenthood to a shared parenthood. One of the lovely things about our times, as I see it, Phil, is that there are a whole lot of options open to the individual, of which singling is one. Yes. Coupling is yet another, exclusive or non-exclusive. Triads, three people linking up, for instance. But, Commuter links. Yes, but who wants to be raised by a non-exclusive pair of parents. I mean, Ideally that... everyone, because I think exclusive parenting is a very damaging thing. It tends to cause individuals to fixate on a specific set of parents and leave them vulnerable to lifelong suffering, lifelong jealousy, mm -hmm. rivalry, right. competitiveness. Let me make sure we've got you now, Mr. Asfandiari. You're saying that if, if, if someone doesn't want to get married, that's okay. And if they want to have children, that's okay too. And that that child would be raised by what? A community of adults? Yes, essentially people who share common values. And I think we're moving toward that as well. For instance, child care center is a step in that direction. FM 2030's primer on how to prepare for life in the 21st century contains checklists you can use to gauge how ready you are for life in the future. Though some readers may never be ready for the author's dismissive view of traditions and rituals. Here's what he says about weddings. Wedding ceremonies, these are rituals that allow two people to announce to the world that they now belong to each other. Weddings would be more honest if the bride and bridegroom peed on each other to establish their territory. Keep out everybody, this is now my property. The idea is that we're moving away from rituals and from exclusivity and territoriality. We're growing more and more fluid, more and more global, more and more mobile. Professional futurists are usually cautious, circumspect, and value neutral in their predictions, so as not to offend or disturb their patrons. Although FM consulted frequently for corporations and governments, he stands out for his radicalism, his commitment that the future was not only about anticipating better profit-making opportunities or methods of mass destruction, but about embodying and spreading the compassionate values necessary for a safe, humane future. From his vegetarianism to his opposition to the death penalty to his opposition to the nation state, FM was unhesitating in calling for a revolution in values. You know, a lot of people who are progressive or who are forward looking, even some of my fellow futurists or people who, who are interested in futurism and future studies, 
They think that to be future-oriented or to be very forward-looking means to talk high-tech or, for example, to talk space or to attend conferences in space. And what I'm suggesting is that it is also important to focus on our level of compassion, how compassionate are we, how sensitive are we to the fragility of all life, are we able to identify with other peoples elsewhere on the planet. For example, right here in this country, we still have, we still have such a crude and and, and, and violent thing as the death penalty. Well, this doesn't make sense. A person who supports the death penalty, or a person who, for example, sits down and eats the flesh of a butchered animal, or a f person who, for example, wears furs, or a person who watches violent spectacles on television, such a person, in my view, needs to take a look at its level of humanity. The future, the future is not just about new technology. The future is not just about the space program. The future is not just about genetics. The future is not just about neural networks. The future is not just about uh, massive pro parallel processing. It's not about a lot of fancy technology. To be sure, it's about that also. But it's also about changes in values. A refinement, a progression in our values and our social processes. You can have all the technology in the world, but if our values are from the jungle, if our values are anachronistic, if they are replete with violence and intolerance and so forth, what good old fancy technology? There are people in Washington, D.C., I'm sure you've heard them, who say, let's give computers to every person. Well, that's wonderful. But we also need to pay attention to our values, and that's precisely what we are doing tonight. Whether we get a chance to meet FM 2030 again in 50 years, and whether all of his predictions and optimisms have played out as quickly as he hoped, his example of sexy, passionate commitment to building a radically democratic and extremely attractive future continues to inspire those who read his works. As we set about building a transnational human rights and values framework for the governance of biotechnology, there could be no better exemplar of applied humanist bioethics than the life and work of FM 2030.